शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतिर द्यव शांतिर दिशा शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशांतिर वायु शांतिरादित्य शांतिर चंद्रमा शांतिर नक्षत्राणिशांतिराप शांति रोषदय शांतिर वनस्पत शांति गौ शांति रजा शांति रश्व शांति पुरुष शांति ब्रह्म शांति ब्राह्मण शांति शांति रेव शांति शांति मे अस्तु शांति ही मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काय मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शंस मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे दे बी पीस इन एवरीवन एंड इन एवरीथिंग सर्वेत्र सुखिन सन्तु सर्वे सन्तु निरामया सर्वे भद्रा पश्य कशि दुख भाग भवस्तर तो दुर्गा सर्वो भद्रा पश्य सर्वसद्बुद्धिमानोतु सर्वसर्वत्र नंद may all be happy and healthy may all see what is good and may no one experience misery may all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies may people everywhere find joy and fulfillment let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts the good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in everyone the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
शांति 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 हरि ही हो असतोमा सत्कमय तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आबिरावीर्मेधी रुद्रय ते दक्षिण मुखम ते नमा मे द डिवाइन लीडस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट from death to immortality with the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us <coughs> happy easter this is the day that uh, we are reminded 
something that um, we need to keep reminding ourselves every day, not just once in a year, of the simple truth that death is not the end, that eternal life is real and possible. What happened on this day about 2,000 years ago shows us the power of the spirit over body and mind. And most importantly, Easter teaches us that Jesus is not simply a historical figure, not simply someone who was in the past, but someone who is with us today, right now, right here, as a spiritual reality. The, the historical facts of what happened on this day are well known. We know that after the crucifixion, uh, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb very early the next day, uh, the day after the Sabbath, was on Sunday, to finish the ritual anointing of Jesus' body. And instead, she and the two other women who had gone there, they found there an empty grave. An angel tells them not to be afraid. They are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women go out and flee from the tomb. They say nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is what we read in Luke. In the longer version of Mark, we read that the risen Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene and to 11 other disciples. By this time, Judas had already uh, killed himself. So this, this is, these are the facts that have come down to us. Now, understanding an event like this, we have to ask ourselves, we the observers, those of us who are trying to understand what this means, have to ask ourselves where we are located. Our perspective will depend on where we are in space and time. It's like uh, watching the marathon. Um, what we see depend on where we are standing. Like the Boston Marathon, if you're standing near the, the starting point, or if you're starting near Kenmore Square here, very close to the end, or if you're starting at the finishing line, uh, what we see at these different points will be a little different. And of course, if we are one of the runners, if we are running along with them, then what we will see will still be different. Now, each of these de descriptions will depend on where we are, but every perspective, although they may not be identical, they are all authentic and deserve respect. So every perspective needs to be taken seriously. There is no such thing as a purely objective viewpoint. Now, according to some who have tried to understand the events at Easter, uh, they see it as historical in the sense that whatever happened that day was not purely subjective not simply in the minds of those who saw Jesus, but these things really happened. Now, what they mean by that is that they take the story literally and don't like the, the metaphorical understanding of the events. What their understanding implies, let us say, is that if in those days there were cameras around, uh, the camera would have exactly captured whatever we find in this story, so that events of those days could be filmed. Now, many others feel that the events were not historical in that sense. The Easter experience was not an experience, according to them, that could be videotaped. Ramakrishna's visions, for instance, of the different deities, Ramakrishna's vision of Jesus, of Muhammad, uh, could not be videotaped. But that does not make it unreal. So the definition of what is real as opposed to what is objectively viewed or what can be captured on a camera, um, uh, we have to figure that out in our own minds. Now, what is it that I define as real? There's one story in Luke uh, 24, 13, 25. You can see the, um, this point is, is emphasized. This is the story of two followers of Jesus that um, in the story we see that 
the arisen Jesus was not in his physical body, but much more so in a spiritual body. So the story goes like this. These two followers are walking on the road to Emmaus on Easter Sunday. Now these two followers then are followed or joined by a stranger. And the stranger asks them, oh, what are you talking about? And they say, are you the only one who doesn't know what's been happening these last few days? We know that the last few days before the crucifixion, amazing things were occurring. And people are talking about it. And so this stranger asked these people, uh, what, what are you talking about? And they are surprised that this stranger has not even heard about those things. They say, uh, they tell him then all the, the, the miracles, all the wonderful things that were happening in those days. Um, and they continue to walk together for a few hours, but they still don't recognize the stranger. As they come near the village, the stranger is about to leave. They tell him, stay with us for it is evening and the day is far from spent. The stranger agrees to do so, and they sit at a table for the evening, and then we read, the stranger took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And only then, only then they recognized who this stranger was. And as soon as they recognized him, we read, he vanished from their sight. Now how could Jesus just vanish? So many refer to this story and to, to show that the, the experience of Jesus that his contemporaries had on Easter was not of the, the physical Jesus, but of a Jesus of a much more deeper, real um, dimension of his personality. So the resurrection of Jesus was not in the literal sense, but in a much deeper, it has a much deeper, much richer significance. The word resurrection, as it was understood in the first century Jewish and early Christian context means an entry into a different kind of existence. And therefore, when, as we try to understand and, and celebrate Easter, we have to recognize that we see Jesus as someone who lives today in a very real sense of the term. Because it's not just those few people and for those few days who experienced Jesus after his crucifixion. In fact, we read several instances. We read in the, the epistles of Paul, which was several years after the event, he experienced Jesus, the presence of Jesus. And we know down the centuries, many mystics, saints, and even people today, our own contemporaries, many have experienced the presence of Jesus. So therefore, whenever we reflect on him, meditate on him, think about him, we are not thinking of someone of the past, but someone who is with us today. Now, all great prophets and incarnations have these two dimensions. There is the historical dimension and there is the spiritual dimension. Now, historically, all of these great ones, they, they are born and they die like other human beings. But spiritually, they live and they continue to teach, to inspire, to protect, and to guide. And that is why those of us who meditate on these great personalities, reflect on them, learn from them, are able to transform our lives today because their presence is not simply an imagination in our mind, but they are very real. In fact, as um, the kind of phrase that Ramakrishna used when Narendra Nath, as a young man, went and asked him, have you seen God? And Ramakrishna said, yes, I've seen him. I see him more intensely than I see you. So the reality that Jesus and these great ones represent is the reality of a much greater, much deeper, much richer variety than even the reality of the world that we experience. So these teachings of Jesus, which continue to inspire us today, I would like to dwell very briefly today on his teaching regarding the neighbor. We read in, in, in the books that once a lawyer asked Jesus what he should do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus replied by asking him what was said in the Torah. 
Now, although the word Torah is often translated as the law, um, what it really meant was all the spiritual teachings of, of those days. The lawyer said that the Torah called for a wholehearted love of God and our one's neighbor. And then the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Instead of giving him a definition, Jesus told him a story. And that story has come down to us today as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the story, I mean, all of you are probably aware of this. A man was traveling on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by bandits who robbed him and left him half dead. A priest and a Levite, a Levite is a temple official, saw him lying there but passed by on the other side of the road. Shortly after, a Samaritan, a Samaritan is a, a man from Samaria in northern Palestine, stopped, looked after the victim, took him to an inn, and then Jesus said, it was the Samaritan who had acted in the way a neighbor should. I think this is a very small parable, but there's so much to reflect on, so much to think about. In, in ancient times, as in the world in which we live even today, we always draw a line between those who are considered insiders and those who are considered outsiders. And at the time of Jesus, um, Romans, Greeks, Syrians, Samaritans, and Jews shared the land of Israel. So it was a very uh, a land that was shared by by many people with different identities. And so the lawyer was genuinely asking the question, well, in this kind of a, a diverse society, as it seemed to them, um, who is really my neighbor? Because um, even though all of these different people shared the same land, uh, their self-perceptions were different. The Jew Jewish among them saw themselves as the chosen people of the Lord. They didn't see the Romans, Syrians, and others as chosen. So someone was like, these are my people. So this idea of my people and others, outsiders, uh, that, um, as you can see, uh, that's, that was there then, and it's there even today. Um, those days, for instance, it was OK to levy interest on, on foreigners, but, um, but not so to one's own brother, that is, my own, my own people should, be, should, not have, should have some privileges which should not be extended to people who are not my own. So this, and so those who are my own could be considered as neighbors, but those who are not my own, they're aliens. In fact, those, that terminology gets used even today. Now, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, where, the, where this uh, person was traveling, uh, it's it was dangerous then, and it seems, I've never been to that part of the world, but, but it's, uh, I hear that it's a pretty uh, hostile terrain, even today, not so easy to, to, to walk across. And there is even dis uh, difference in altitude. Uh, now, in this story, no explanation is given of why the priest and the Levite um, refused to help the victim. We just read that as soon as they saw, uh, they just crossed the street. And not very unusual in some sense. Sometimes when, and that, that happens. In fact, sometimes you might have seen um, uh, some YouTube videos of, uh, especially in big cities, if there is, there is someone who is in who's uh, fallen down or who's who is in pain? Um, some people definitely would go to help, but a lot of others who who rather not would just kind of take a different route, rather avoid the whole scene. Um, maybe because oh, I've got to be a hurry, I can't stop, and I I can't waste my time and so on. But there are a lot of people who would like to not get into situations where help is needed, that help could be offered but they somehow try to avoid it. So what, what, was, what happened then was not something difficult to understand. Now, the actions of the, the priest and the Levite, apparently people who, who should have been at least technically closer to God, depending on the, on the vocation, uh, they actually crossed the street and did not offer any help to this victim. But a Samaritan, in great contrast, took good care of the victim and the victim from the story is inferred to be, was probably a Jewish person. 
Now, the contrast becomes stronger when we realize that in those days, the Jewish people um, avoided the Samaritans and did not regard them as belonging to the chosen people. Um, so the Samaritans were not considered neighbors by them. And it was this despised Samaritan. In fact, if you look at the history, um, it seems that um, I think probably seven or eight centuries before Christ, uh, the Assyrians um, went to the, the northern kingdom of, of, of Israel and, and destroyed the temple. Um, and they deported most of the people from there, which was the Samaria was the capital of that northern kingdom. And they, they deported most of the people. And some of the people who stayed back, they, uh, they intermingled and remarried with these Assyrians who were considered pagans. And then later on, several centuries later, when, when these people who were deported came back, they looked down upon these Samarians, uh, the, the people from Samaria who, who were later called Samaritans, but because they had uh, intermingled with the pagans. And that's why they were really a despised lot. Now, it was from among that despised lot that this person comes and offers help. So that's the kind of contrast being drawn by Jesus. So it is this Samaritan who cleaned the man's injuries with oil and wine. He bandaged the man up, took him to an inn, and he looked after him. Now at the end of this story, after narrating this story, Jesus asked the lawyer, um, who according to him was then a true neighbor in this story? And the, and the lawyer said, well, it was the man who showed compassion. Then Jesus tells him, go. And now you do the same yourself. Now by challenging the divisions between the Jews and the Samaritans, Jesus made it clear that anyone who responds to someone in need of help is a neighbor. So that's, that's the question. We understand the, in general, the meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. But who is my neighbor is an important question. Is it just the person staying next to my uh, house or, or in my neighborhood or people who I see as my own, who exactly deserves this kind of um, understanding and compassion that is extended to a neighbor. Now, we know that many people put a limit on compassion. Um, we know that charity begins at, oh, at home, but for many people, charity not just begins at home, it also ends at home. In other words, the people who may do a lot to those whom they see as their own. Of course, a family, for instance. That there are people who truly love their family and do everything for their family. But oftentimes, that spirit of help, that spirit of compassion would dry up as soon as you cross the boundary, that wall of the family. That I may not then want to help someone who is not my own. Now, compassion, the word compassion, literally means suffering with. It is a state of being that gives us the capacity to help anyone in need, irrespective of the people's nationality, creed, religion, race, or color. Now, that is the message Jesus consistently put, up, put across through all his teachings, that no one was to be excluded from God's love and compassion. We are reminded uh, of in the Gita, for instance, in chapter 6 of the Gita, there is this verse. It goes like this. Atmau pamyena sarvatra samam pasyati yorjuna sukham va yadi va dukham sa yogo paramo mataha. Which means, he who judges the pleasure or pain everywhere by the same standard as he applies to himself, that yogi is regarded as the highest by the same standard as he applies to himself. So that's the test before a spiritual seeker, that when I judge others, um, when I try to understand others, am I putting myself in that place? A lot of times we are quite forgiving to our own selves and not so forgiving to others. A lot of times we are able to justify our own weaknesses, our own mistakes, our own drawbacks. 
but we don't extend that same justification to other people's drawbacks, other people's weaknesses. Um, and this may sound odd, but psychologists have known this for long, that people who are forgiving to themselves are, are very unforgiving to others. And contrast, in contrast, those who are very strict with themselves often tend to be very forgiving, very understanding with others. Um, normally one would have thought that this kind of consistency would occur, but actually in, in, well, as they say, human beings are the most inconsistent people. You see, it's like this. We like to think of ourselves as this very logical, rational people. But the more we look at our lives, we see that um, um, very little about our life is truly rational. In fact, as I often say, most of the decisions we make in life uh, are not really arrived at through a logical process. Most of the choices we make, the decisions we make, are, are, are of our own, oftentimes, emotional responses. Emotions which are strongly influenced by our biases and our prejudices. But because we like to see ourselves as reasonable, logical, rational beings, after we arrive at a, at a certain decision, we then find a, we take the help of logic to reach that predetermined conclusion. And then we kind of flip the cart and then say, well, I, I thought it out and then I arrived at that. That's, that happens consistently in our lives. Um, and so this is the teaching that we read in the Gita, very similar to what Jesus taught, that if I see someone suffering, is that someone, someone else or is it my brother, my neighbor, my sister? What is the relationship between the objective world that I see and this subject who is experiencing it? In fact, our dealing with the world is based on how we see how we are related to the world. And when our understanding of the world changes, our relationship with the world changes, the way we work, the way we respond will also automatically change. There is a very ancient um, Sanskrit verse which goes like this. Ayam nijaha parova iti ganana laghu chetasam udara charitanantu vasudhaiva kutumbakam which simply means ayam nijaha, these are my people. Parova, those are not my people. So once we make this distinction, these are mine, those are not mine, this verse says, iti ganana, people who think like this are laghu chetasam. Laghu means small. So small-minded people make this distinction, these are mine, those are not mine. Well, a wall. The moment I build a wall, I can say then, who is in this side of the wall and who is on the other side of the wall. And the second line of the verse says, Udara charitanantu, people whose hearts have opened, people who have broken all the walls, vasudhaiva kutumbakam, vasudha means the entire universe, kutumbakam becomes one family. So once we remove the walls, then all the distinctions go away. Now, again, a wall is, is not necessarily only something that is outside. Actually, we are creating walls all the time by the different identities we take upon ourselves. It's like this. If I now take upon the identity of, of, a, of a Red Sox fan, I've actually already created a wall within my heart that I'm a Sox fan. So anyone outside that wall um, then is my enemy. Um, or if I, again, all the walls created based on gender, creed, race, nationality, color, are nothing but walls. Because the moment I say, I am this, I'm already saying everything other than this, I am not. Those are different. And the goal of spiritual life is really to break all these walls. Because a wall is something that restricts us, that binds us, that confines us. 
And if it's true that we are infinite beings, freedom really means um, nothing is obstructing me, nothing is stopping me. And as long as I have these walls of different identities within me, uh, I cannot be truly free. Swami Vivekananda once said, um, referring in fact to exactly this teaching, love thy neighbor as thyself, and then he asks, why should I not injure my neighbor? The Atman is absolute and all-pervading, therefore infinite. There cannot be two infinities, but they would limit each other and would become finite. Also, each individual soul is a part and parcel of that universal soul, which is infinite. Therefore, in injuring his neighbor, the person actually injures himself. This is the basic metaphysical truth underlying all ethical codes. And that's the verse that I quoted earlier from the Gita. Atma Pamyena means seeing myself in others. Describing the enlightened being in the Upanishads, it is said, what are the among the different characteristics of enlightened beings, the Upanishad says an enlightened being sees one's self in everyone around and sees everyone within oneself. So this distinction, this the other, when the other goes out, then truly our heart is filled with compassion. It's truly then we see that everyone is a neighbor. There are no, there are no others in life. So this uh, parable of, of the Good Samaritan, there's a lot to think about it. And we can see all these great teachers, Jesus, the Buddha, Ramakrishna, we see that they taught through stories. And many of the stories are short and apparently look very simple. But the more we try to dwell on them, the more we try to reflect on them, we see how relevant they are even today how human nature as it is hasn't changed much, that today these stories bring us a message that um, teaches us how we should live. And so on this great day, as we reflect on the significance, the meaning, and experience the joy of Easter, let's also reflect on the meaning of neighbor. One final thought about this, something uh, similar to what we saw um, about a week ago. Ideally, that at any given moment, the person I am with, that is my neighbor. If we can just keep this thought in mind, that whoever I am with at any given moment, at any given spot on this planet, that person is my neighbor. And as much as it lies in my power, I can share whatever I can. I can help in whichever way I can. The more I'm able to break down the walls that, that separate us from others, the happier we become. And the happier we become, the more we are able to share that happiness with others. We can only share with others what we have. If we want to share love, there must be love in our own heart. If we want to share peace, there must be peace in our own heart. If we want to share joy, that joy must be in our own heart. Because we cannot share with others what we don't have. And the best way to have all these, these are the real riches. These are the, this is the real wealth. A wealth that no one can take away from us. Um, through all these great parables, and especially this parable of the, of the Good Samaritan, we see that that wealth, that immense wealth of fulfillment, contentment and joy is in our own heart, provided we learn to see that everyone around us is our own neighbor. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu.
next Sunday, we'll have um, Antar Yoga, uh, as we do uh, once a month. Uh, we'll have two of our members doing spiritual reading. There'll be reflection. There'll be music. And we'll also celebrate the birthdays of all of those who, all of you who are born in the month of April. Uh, so please, uh, all of you are welcome, and especially those uh, of you who are born in April. On Wednesday, we'll continue with the study of the Gita. On Tuesday and Saturday, our meditations will also continue as usual. We'll have the prayer now, and then we'll have another song before closing. So uh, prayer on page three of the books. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto you. Thank you.